I'm Johnny Buchanan. Now this I think is going to be a relatively short little video, but it's going to answer a question that's come up a few times through the comments on YouTube. Remember, I always love those and they often lead to the content that I go on to make because of course, ultimately this channel is all about trying to help you guys make the music that you want. So if ever you have a question, please send it in. And a few people have said, how might I get a MIDI controller to do some interesting things with some of Logic's synths? Most notably sculpture is a question that people ask about. Um, and we're going to look at that within this video. Now what I've done here is to load a pad sound, which is actually part of the Cinematic Pads collection. If you haven't already had a look, please do go to learn.johnobuchananmusic.com. Shameless plug. But of course, there I'm making deeper dive courses into various things to do with Logic. And also we do have a little collection of sounds there, which I think are quite nice, which aren't so expensive either. And this is one of those sounds. It's called Nostalgic Pulses. And it sounds like this. Okay, so a nice little patch providing all this movement and momentum. Now, I've made a couple of videos in the past about ways of working with sculpture. If this isn't an instrument you know very well, do go and watch those because it's capable of amazing things. And a couple of those particularly relate to modulation, ways of getting sounds moving within sculpture. And the second part of the modulation video about sculpture introduces movement around what we refer to as the morph square. And in order to get that doing something, firstly, I need to just turn on this pad. Now, what that does is it provides me with this little red ball. And what happens when I move this red ball is that I can change the way that parameters look and behave. So in other words, anything that you can see on screen that's moving is moving because I can set up a series of snapshots, which I can then move between to produce extra sort of sonic movement within the sound. And to demonstrate exactly what I mean, I'm going to set up a few of these right now. So I'm going to focus mostly on what we refer to as the material square. What this does is to allow me to make my sculpture sound either made out of nylon or wood or steel or glass. The whole idea of sculpture is that we have this kind of virtual string made of one of those components or a combination of them. And what we can do is to bias the sound towards the way that that string might behave depending on what it's made of. And what I can do is to click on the morph square in positions A, B, C, and D, and I can create snapshots which relate to the position position of any parameters that I can see on the screen and produce offsets towards uh, that position. I'll show you what I mean. So what I'm going to do is, if it turns out that this little red ball ventures towards A, I want my string to feel more as though it's made of nylon. If I venture towards B, I want it to feel more as though it's made out of wood. If it, I venture towards C, I want it to be made more out of steel. I'm not going so extreme all the way across to just that material, but I'm biasing it in that direction. And if it turns out that I end up anywhere near D, I want it to feel like it's made out of glass. Now, what that actually means in real terms is that if I now grab this little red ball and begin to move it around, you can see that that movement is tracking those offsets that I set up. And because I haven't gone to the full extremes, it's biased in those directions without being as extreme as it being solidly just one of those materials, which I think is going to work out quite nicely. Now, what that really means in real terms is that when I play this sound back and I begin to manipulate the morph square, we'll hear that sonic evolution as I move around the square.
So we've got all these subtle little offsets, which I think are really nice. And you'll have noticed that other things are mapped here too. As I said, anything with a red dot is a mappable parameter. And some of these are predetermined. They've already been set up for this sound. And again, I could go around the strength, for example, for object one, um, and I could create the offsets that I wanted simply by moving this red ball into a particular position and then choosing the offsets that I wanted to apply, biasing them wherever I wanted them to go. And as I say, that's just a recap of something that we've looked at in a previous episode already. So the question then comes, how might I move these parameters myself using a controller rather than having to manipulate it using the automation? In other words, if I have a control set, particularly an XY pad, which I don't, spoiler alert, but if I wanted to set up any controller to do something useful to manipulate this, how could I do that? Well, I've got my Ghost Note Audio um, uh, Conductor 2 here, which is ready to spring into life for us and do some interesting things. And it's also going to demonstrate the interesting ways that we have to learn to use controllers if they aren't a direct correlation for the thing that we're trying to um, work with. If it turned out I was working with things which are fader-based, perfect. As it turns out, I kind of want left-right movement and up-and-down movement. One of those feels more intuitive than another using a control surface, but all is going to be well. Now then, by default, what happens when you plug in any control surface and you get it working is that if you want to find out which controllers are automatically assigned to a control surface like this, Logic will tell you. Now, by default, when you first open Logic, usually the transport bar looks like this. It tells us the bar and the beat. It tells us the tempo. It tells us the time signature we're in. And if we've entered it, it tells us the key that we've worked in as well. But if you drop down here and come to custom, what you'll find is that everything gets a bit bigger. And in particular, you'll find that you get MIDI in and out lights showing you MIDI activity. And if I push one of these faders, we're going to discover straight away that what I've got is a value which is rising and falling, showing me the value that it's tracking in real time. But much more importantly, it's also showing me the controller number, number 11. And it turns out that this fader is set to MIDI controller 11. So if what I wanted to do would be to move the morph squares red ball in terms of its vertical movement using this controller, what I need to do is to come down here to the MIDI control assign area. And what I'm going to do is to come to the morph X um, uh, setting here. In fact, I want morph Y, apologies. Up and down movement is going to be on morph Y. And what I'm going to do, the Y axis in other words, and I'm going to set this to 11. And what that should mean straight away by doing that is I've got movement through the vertical plane on this fader. And that's going to be great for vertical movement, but it's not going to be so good for horizontal movement. So that's one way that I can assign a controller like that. I can look up here in the MIDI in light up here and discover which controller is being used. The alternative is I could decide to map morph X, in other words, um, horizontal movement in a slightly different way. I want to map that to this fader here. And the way that I'm going to do that is to come here and come to Learn MIDI. And the moment I do that, Sculpture is now waiting. And the moment I touch this fader, it's going to have assigned it. It's picked up what its controller number was. It turns out that's the mod wheel, controller number one. And now what I've got is horizontal movement here. So if it turns out that I wanted the sort of movement I had before where I was moving sort of subtly in this area, in other words, from a kind of um, vertical position here, left and right. And then what I want to do is to kind of come back the other way. I'm in a position to use these either independently of one, each, uh, of one another, or of course, I can get involved by using two hands. And it's a little bit like, um, is it patting your head and rubbing your tummy at the same time? Is that the old thing that people used to have to do? Look at that, I'm just practicing. I'm becoming a sort of ninja sort of just get around this square. It's a bit like playing golf. Shall I stop talking? Okay, I think that sounds like a good idea. So what we can do is to do that kind of manipulation now, but we can do it in real time using a controller. Because it feels a bit like golf, I couldn't stop anywhere other than putting the red dot in the hole. I'm a child.
what can I tell you? Okay, so that's how we can do that within Sculpture. So what that does then is to raise the question of what other synths within Logic allow for this kind of MIDI controller assignment. And of course, that is something that you should absolutely go and explore. And I'm going to help you by pushing you in the direction ever so slightly of the ES2. Having been in this nice, warm, fuzzy place, we're going to end up in a slightly more dramatic, synthy place in just a moment. So if I just open this up, this is just, I think, Logic's, uh, the ES2's default patch. Look at that, still a beauty, isn't it, after all this time? Should we have some C major to celebrate? <laughs> feels like we should. Okay, so what I've got down here within the ES2, down in the bottom left-hand corner, once again, is a series of MIDI controller assignments. And what this means is that within uh, the ES2's matrix, where I can pick targets to manipulate and sources to manipulate those, I can have some fun. So what I might do would be to say, okay, I want the pitch of all three oscillators. And what I want to do is to map that to one of the MIDI controller assignments. Now it turns out there are six of those, controller A through to F, and some are automatically pre-mapped. So this is gonna be a foot control, um, MIDI controller number four. This is the breath control, nine is here, unassigned. And then we've got some general purpose ones as well. I do love MIDI and how it labels itself. Let's come to number nine for a moment, or let's choose much more specifically controller C which is going to be here. And then what I'm in a position to do is to choose the amount that the pitch is going to be manipulated by controller C. And I'm going to set that at a lot. Now, of course, what I haven't done is to choose what controller C is going to be. And of course, again, using my little fader, I can remind myself that controller number 11 is this particular MIDI controller. So it stands to reason that if I select that from the drop down menu, then what I'm now in a position to do is to control the amount that the pitch is going to be affected by this fader. So at zero, it should be zero. Sorry, at uh, the fader position of zero, it should be none. And then we can have some fun. One more? Okay. Oh, a low one? Okay, sure. Your wish is my command. Now then, is that useful in this patch? No, probably not, unless Looney Tunes is your thing. But if it's not, then of course we could think of more subtle ways of being able to do this. But it turns out there are six assignments we could use, which could be applied to different parameters. And I reckon in exactly the same way that within the nostalgic pulses, nostalgic, nostalgic pulses patch, ha, huh, we could find some interesting ways of being able to manipulate that sound. Probably within the ES2, we could work a little bit harder than just making silly cartoon noises. But if you want to take your MIDI controller and map it to things within Logic, that's how it's done. The, uh, the transport bar is definitely gonna help you track down the assignments you have. And of course, it can work the other way around. If there are specific controllers you want to use, you can reprogram your controller with the MIDI um, uh, effect numbers that you want, the MIDI assignment numbers that you want to make sure that they're matching to a particular thing. So if you've got them set up a certain way and you always want them to do the same thing but within different synths, you can absolutely do it that way around as well. But now what we've got is a little bit of hardware control over some of this software, including some of the more beautiful instruments. One more. See you next time.